Those are just... That was good. You just heard President Biden accidentally say something that we definitely weren't supposed to hear during a totally unplanned hot mic moment after his State of the Union address on Thursday. He said he's going to have a heart-to-heart -heart moment with Netanyahu about the war crimes being committed with the bombs that he's giving him. And, you know, from time to time, we'll get stories that somehow leak to the press about how Biden is just really fed up at Netanyahu, and this time he called him an asshole privately. But most people see this for what it is, an attempt to placate his Democratic Party base while not meaningfully changing the policies. Now, in an interview with Jonathan Capehart on MSNBC, he was asked about this hot mic moment, and here's what he said. Um, you were caught on a hot mic after your State of the Union address talking to Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Senator uh, Michael Bennett uh, saying, quote, I told him, BB, and don't repeat this, but you and I are going to have a come to Jesus meeting. What do you mean by that? What I meant was it's an expression used in the southern part of my state, meaning a serious meeting. And uh, it was uh, I've known BB for 50 years and. He knew what I meant by it. So what's the, what's the come to Jesus part? What, what's, what's rid, what tough get, love do you, are you going to give to the prime minister? What's happening is he has a right to defend Israel, a right to continue to pursue Hamas. But he must, he must, he must pay more attention to the innocent lives being lost as a consequence of the actions taken. He's hurting, I, in my view, he's hurting Israel more than helping Israel by making the rest of the world, it's contrary to what Israel stands for. And I think it's a big mistake. So I want to see a ceasefire. And I'm starting with a major, major exchange of prisoners for a six week period. We're going into Ramadan, it should be nothing happening. And we should build off of that ceasefire. And look, I've spoken with the majority of the Arab leaders from Saudi Arabia to Egypt to Jordan. They're all prepared to fully recognize Israel and begin to rebuild the region. And uh, that's that's the focus. What comes after Gaza? What's next? It's a tough decision, but there's a lot that can be done. So his plan is to have a stern talking to with Netanyahu and explain to him how this genocide in Gaza runs counter to Israel's own interests, and he should probably stop. Now, he's right about that. Their reputation internationally is in the gutter, but Biden is saying... If you listen to me, I can help you repair these relationships with Arab countries in the region, but you've got to listen first. Help me help you. Now, that's all well and good, but this is a very naive position for Biden to take. The carrot approach has failed, and now it's time for the stick approach. Netanyahu has made it very clear he is not going to listen to Biden unless he cuts off weapons and stops vetoing ceasefire resolutions on the UN Security Council. I think anything short of that is going to be woefully inadequate. Netanyahu isn't going to suddenly have this change of heart if you say the right words to him. He is a war criminal doing a genocide and needs to be treated as such. Now, Biden was asked if he has any red lines, such as an invasion of Rafah, for example, which he is cautioning Israel against doing. And his answer here is, I think, going to perfectly demonstrate exactly why Netanyahu isn't listening to anything that Biden is saying. What is your red line? with Prime Minister Netanyahu, do you have a, a, a red line? For instance, would invasion of Rafa, which you have urged him not to do, would that be a red line? It is a red line, but I'm never going to leave Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical. So there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead as a consequence of going after. There's other ways to deal, to get to, to deal with the, with, with the trauma caused by Hamas. In other words, there's nothing Israel can do that will make Biden cut off weapons to them. Hmm, I just can't figure out why Netanyahu refuses to listen to Biden. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, haven't they had a good heart-to-heart -heart moment? Why won't Netanyahu listen? This is really infuriating. 
because Biden knows what he's doing. Now, predictably, Netanyahu watched that same interview that we just watched, and he viewed it as a green light to do whatever he wants. And I say this because in an interview following Biden's interview, he made it very clear that he doesn't give a damn about the demands that the Biden administration is making, and he fully intends on defying him and invading Rafa. And I mean, why wouldn't he? Because Biden has made it clear there's going to be no accountability if he defies him. So why wouldn't he just do what he wants to do? Politico reports, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he intends to press ahead with an invasion of the city of Rafa on the southern border of the Gaza Strip in defiance of United States President Joe Biden, who has warned such an offensive would be a red line. Israel's Prime Minister also doubled down on his rejection of the possibility of a Palestinian state, a topic that pits Israel against most of the rest of the world. Quote, the positions that I espouse are supported by the overwhelming majority of Israel Israelis who say to you after October 7th, we don't want to see a Palestinian state, he said. Netanyahu also directly addressed criticism from Biden, who has said the Israeli leader is hurting Israel more than helping Israel. Netanyahu hit back, saying, while he didn't know exactly what the president meant, if Biden was saying he was contravening the wishes or interests of Israel, he was wrong on both counts. Now, of course, Netanyahu knows exactly what Biden meant by that, but he went on to say that the Israeli people support him and he would reject any attempt by a U.S. president to ram a Palestinian state down their throats. So, I mean, yeah, this is what happens when you say you'll never cut off weapons to Israel. Now he's saying, okay, you know what? Not only am I going to go ahead with my ground invasion of Rafah, but also I'm going to reiterate that we don't want a Palestinian state. He's saying this after Biden says there's nothing they can do that will get me to cut off the weapons to them. This is cause and effect right here. This is the result of Biden's weak foreign policy towards Israel. They are being completely defiant because they have no reason not to be. But shockingly enough, we got another leaked story about how Biden is now considering conditioning military aid to Israel if they invade Gaza. Quote, while Biden has not made any decision on limiting future weapons transfers, officials said that he very well might do so if Israel launches a new operation that further imperils Palestinian civilians. It's something he's definitely thought about, said one of the officials who, like the others, was granted anonymity to speak freely. Now, pause for a moment and guess whether or not this is going to deter Netanyahu at all. Do you think it will? Are you skeptical? Me too, because back in November, Biden then said that conditioning aid was a worthwhile thought, but never actually followed through with it. So here's what's going to happen. Netanyahu is going to defy Biden once again and go ahead with the ground invasion of Rafah as planned. And... Thousands more innocent civilians will die, and Biden is not going to do a single thing about it. Because this is what we've seen again and again and again for months now. And I would love for Biden to prove me wrong, but why should we expect anything to change if there's been no accountability? If Biden isn't going to make a policy change? The answer is we shouldn't. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So, I mean, it's just, it's exhausting because this is going to keep happening if Biden doesn't actually rein them in. And he said very clearly, not going to do shit. So this is the outcome of that. And I mean, Biden can condemn Netanyahu both publicly and privately as much as he wants. But if he continues to supply Netanyahu with weapons that he's using to exterminate Gazans, Biden owns these war crimes. That makes him complicit. And I'm glad that Biden is no longer doubting the number of civilian casualties coming out of Gaza. But it's hard to fathom just how big of a number 30,000 is and 12,000 of which are children. But I want to pivot now, and rather than talking about diplomacy and the politics of this, talk about the actual people being affected by this. And CNN actually did a phenomenal job at putting these large numbers into perspective and really humanizing Israel's victims here. So let's watch that. These are tiny figures of children on the walls of our studio, one for almost each of the 12,800 kids who have died in Gaza, according to numbers from Gaza's health ministry. The death toll, quite frankly, is hard to keep up with. Airstrikes and now malnutrition and dehydration are killing them. Premature births are up. 
Mothers dehydrated and traumatized struggle to breastfeed. They can't find formula. They can't find clean water. And without relief, the threat from famine could eclipse that of airstrikes, like the one this past weekend in Rafa that killed five-month-olds, Wasim and Naim Abu Anza, twins, long awaited by their parents who finally conceived 11 years after they married, according to Reuters. Their mother, Rania, told the news agency, we were asleep. We were not shooting and we were not fighting. What is their fault? What is their fault? What is her fault? In October, an Israeli strike killed 11-year-old Malak Sharaf, along with her 10-year-old brother Malik, and their six and three-year-old sisters, Yasmin and Noor, according to the Washington Post. And 13 of their cousins also died. In October, Al Jazeera reported that an airstrike on a home uh, where Gaza bureau chief Wael al dadus family was sheltering after being displaced killed his wife, his 15-year-old son Mahmoud, his 7-year-old daughter Sham, and his one-and-a-half-year-old grandson Adam. In November, brother and sister Tarek and Reem, five and three years old, were asleep side by side when an airstrike killed them in southern Gaza. Their grandfather, Khalid Nabhan, told CNN he was wishing, hoping that they were only sleeping, but they weren't sleeping. They were gone. Al Jazeera reported that Salma Jaber was fleeing Gaza City with her family in December when they came under fire, and the four-year-old was shot in the neck and died. The middle child in the family, Salma's father, described her as mischievous and intelligent. And in January, six-year-old Hind Rajab was trapped in a car for days with the bodies of several family members, all killed, trying to escape northern Gaza. This harrowing audio of her cousin calling the Palestine Red Crescent for help captured the moment that their car came under attack from an Israeli tank. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Hin's body was found the following month, along with two ambulance workers who had gone missing trying to rescue her. There are too many victims to name, there's too many to fathom, and there are countless orphans, like Lana, whose story CNN's Jomana Karadshe told. Six-year-old Lana was under the rubble of her home for three days. Mommy and Daddy are underneath it, she says. I just want Mama. I want Baba. I want my family, Lana cries. You know, we often talk about the political ramifications of this genocide and diplomacy. But as all of these conversations take place, an entire group of people with nowhere to go is being exterminated. And that fact should never be lost on us as we have these conversations and continue to have these conversations. Let this be a radicalizing moment for all of us because it demonstrates the barbarity and cruelty of our system and any lawmaker who supports this. And there are a lot of them who support this. John Fetterman, for example, vocalized support for Israel going into Rafa. They're cheerleading Israel on as countless people suffer and die. Now, at a State of the Union, Biden announced a port that he's creating to allow food into Gaza since Israel is blocking aid from getting in. And he wouldn't have to do this if his ally actually listened to what he wanted, but his ally isn't going to listen to what he wants since he's not holding him accountable. But that port is going to take 60 days, according to expert estimates. And as that time passes, this is going to continue to happen. Aid agencies say children are facing extreme malnutrition and dehydration. 15 children have already died because of it, according to the Ministry of Health. And with so many orphaned and injured, health workers now commonly use a heartbreaking euphemism, wounded children, no surviving family. So with fears of a full-blown famine for millions across Gaza, the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen will travel to Cyprus to discuss plans for a maritime aid corridor to the Gaza coast. As Nada Bashir reports right now, parents are saying goodbye to their sons and daughters. And of course, while these images of their reality are extremely distressing, the mothers who were interviewed say that they do want the world to see. Tiny limbs, bones protruding. The constant sound of crying, 
from children now facing starvation in Gaza. In this overrun hospital ward, anxious mothers watch on as doctors provide whatever care they still can. But for some, there is nothing more to be done. Three-year-old Mila, who had been suffering from acute malnutrition, now another victim of this merciless war. She was healthy. There was nothing wrong with her before, Mila's mother says. Then suddenly, everything dropped. She wasn't eating anything. We had no milk, no eggs, nothing. She used to eat eggs every day before the war, but now we have nothing. Across Gaza, too many are feeling the pain of this deepening hunger crisis. Small children, emaciated and malnourished. These were little Yazan's final moments. His tiny fingers gripped in his mother's hand. He, like Mila, would not make it. Others are still just barely holding on. But there is no telling how long they will survive. Standing beside Mila's body, Dr. Ahmed Salem says many children at this hospital are now dying due to a lack of food and oxygen supplies. With limited aid getting in, many have grown desperate, searching for food wherever they can. Nine-year-old Muhammad says he walks for about a mile every day to collect water for his family. You seem sad. Why? This journalist asks him. Because of the war, he says. It is all too much. On Tuesday, UN experts accused Israel of intentionally starving the Palestinian people in Gaza. <laughs> noting that the Israeli military is now targeting both civilians seeking aid and humanitarian convoys. Israel has denied targeting civilians and says that there is, quote, no limit to the amount of humanitarian aid for civilians in Gaza. But the reality on the ground paints a very different picture. There is no food, no water, no flour, cooking oil or anything, this woman says. Death is better than this. According to a senior UN official, at least a quarter of Gaza's population is now said to be just one step away from famine. It is gut-wrenching to watch these images. Now, as bad as it is right now, just stop for a moment and imagine what an invasion of Rafa would look like and how much worse it would get for these folks, if you can imagine that. But yes, it could somehow get even worse because there are people staying in the middle of the street in tents right now, starving to death. So imagine what a ground invasion would mean for these folks. This is a genocide, full stop. Don't take my word for it. Read South Africa's genocide case. And if you aren't convinced after reading that, then I think you're being purposefully obtuse because this is a genocide and history is going to view this as a genocide. Netanyahu needs to be brought to justice and face war crimes charges at The Hague, and Israel needs to be sanctioned and cut off entirely from the international community. But yet, we can't even get Biden to cut off their weapons or allow a single ceasefire resolution to pass on the UN Security Council. This situation is just so frustrating. And I'm not sure, you know, what Biden's next step is going to be or how this is going to play out in the coming months. But we are living through one of the largest atrocities in human history, and all this talk about politics and diplomacy shouldn't distract us from the fact that human beings are suffering right now, and our government is choosing to let it happen. This is a choice Biden can stop right now if he chooses to cut off weapons, but he's not doing that, and as a result... He's complicit. He's just as guilty as Netanyahu, in my opinion, for allowing this to continue when he has the power to stop it. Come on, man.